Hi, and welcome to part four on our video related to contemporary art. Um, and I want to remind you that we're looking at contemporary global art. Um, in this segment, we're, our first artist is going to be Emily Kame Ying War Reye, um, who is uh, an Australian or Aborigine artist. So at nearly 20 feet wide and nine feet high, um, Emily Kwame um, Ying Ware Ye's painting, um, Earth's Creation is Monumental in its Scale and Impact, um, rivaling abstract expressionist masterpieces by William de Kooning and Jackson Pollock, not only in size, but also in its painterly um, technique. Um, and we're going to be looking at some other examples um, here. And again, you know, this is a pretty huge work um, in terms of its scale. Um, we see patches of bold yellow, greens, reds, and blues that seem to bloom like lush vegetation over the large canvas. Um, it's comprised of gestural, viscous marks, um, swaths of color, um, traces the movement of the artist's hand and body over the canvas. So she is a very gestural painter and really, um, you know, incorporates um, her whole arm and sort of body movement into um, creating these canvases. Um, which would, um, the canvas would have been laid horizontally um, down on the ground as she painted, seated or beside, um, beside the canvas um, and intimately connected um, to her art. Um, so here's an image of her. These are some other examples of her images. So you can see here um, her painting. Um, and she's quite old right now. <laughs> um, so the work made record um, sales at an auction when it sold in 2007 for over $1 million, the highest price ever fetched by a work by a female artist in Australia. Yet just decades earlier, um, Ying Ware Ye was virtually unknown to the world outside her small desert community um, in the Australian county of al Curry. Um, she was a self-taught artist who was trained in ceremonial painting. She rose to international prominence only in her 80s um, and enjoyed a flourishing career at the end of her life. So that is quite unusual. Usually we see artists, you know, start very young and achieve fame within, um, you know, within um, their adult years, young adult years to middle years. Um, so it is rare for someone to achieve fame, you know, in their 80s and in their sort of ge ge <laughs> geriatric stage in life. Um, Ying War Reye was born around 1910 and spent most of her life in an isolated um, amateur community um, in Central Australia. And this is spelled, the community is called A-N-M-A-T-Y-E-R-R. The area, however, was forcibly occupied by European pastoral settlers in the 1920s, and artists, alongside other members of her community, worked on um, the pastoral property. Pastoral refers to the tending of cattle and sheep. In 1976, Aboriginal land rights were legally granted, and she was able, finally, to live independently. Aboriginal culture has been long intimately connected to the landscape of Australia, inhabited by humans for over 40,000 years. The region is characterized by deserts, grasslands, um, and dramatic um, arced rock formations. Um, Ying War Reye was an established elder of her community and was trained to create ceremonial sand paintings inspired by her ritual dreamings, as well as to paint decorative motifs on women's bodies as part of a ceremony called Awe Leye. Um, these visual forms were connected to cultural expressions in song, storytelling, and dance. While her paintings have never been figural, they remain influenced by the culture in which she grew up, as well as the natural environment. And I, I think they're quite exquisite and, and really beautiful. In the late 1970s, Ying Wa Ye Rei, I still have trouble pronouncing her name, began to work in the medium of batiks, um, um, making, wor making works that were purely artistic endeavors for the, for the first time. Um, and batik is sort of like a fabric um, painting where you sort of coat 
where you create designs on fabric like silk or, or something and you have this resist and you create these designs and then whatever has the resist on there won't absorb color. So I know Miss um, Dason teaches it. Um, in 1977, she was a founding participant in the Utopia Woman's Batik group. Her compositions were abstract and featured motifs of repeated dots, acting sometimes as linear strokes, or elsewhere um, used um, to fill large patches of space. A decade later, in 1988, the, um, a gallery in Sydney initiated a summer project that sought to facilitate the creation of Aboriginal art as well as to establish a market for the genre. Sponsored by the collector Robert Holmes, um, a court, curators traveled to Aboriginal homeland of Utopia and delivered acrylic paints and materials. After two weeks, they returned to find abstract and richly expressed the compositions created by many of the artists and held a group exhibition in Sydney. Um, Ying Wareye's painting, um, Emu Woman, which you see here, um, was selected for the cover of the ex exhibition catalog as a gestural as a gesture of respect for her seniority as she was the oldest artist from the community dominated by rich earth tones the painting um, her first ever on canvas contained references to plants and seeds that featured um, in her dreaming ritual against a dark field of charcoal violent uh, violet and black the piece is punctuated with bright marks and tangerine and white hues, which lend the work an electric sense of energy and rhythm. Her decades-long experience in painting directly of the, on the human body informed the curving swells of dotted marks that comprise the composition. Critics lauded the piece and, um, you know, really just thought it was extremely um, well done. And virtually overnight, the artist received international exposure and unprecedented acclaim. The following year, Ying Wa Reye held her first solo exhibition at Utopia Art Sydney, after which she was invited to participate in several renowned international exhibitions and biennials. So we'll go back and look at um, Earth's creation. The arc of Ying Wa Reye's career runs alongside a period of tremendous change in Australia, moving from the end of a phase of colonial settlement, though, to a more ethical embrace of Aboriginal culture by the nation's Western population. Yet the period in which she came to prominence also reflects changes taking place in contemporary art um, internationally, as the 1980s and 1990s saw a notable expansion within the mainstream to include non-Western or minority artists. Earth's creation um, belongs to um, uh, the high colorist phase in Ying Wareye's work, which is characterized by a loosening of her composition. So you can see here that her, stro her strokes are definitely much more gestural and looser than sort of the kind of pointed dot, you know, the dots and the sort of meticulous, um, you know, design, I think, that went into this um, painting she did earlier. Um, her compositions were no longer reliant on pseudo-geometric patterns, and the expansion of her color palette um, um, included a range of tones beyond the familiar clay and, and sort of earthy ochre tones that dominated her prior work. Um, it's still connected to the natural environment, however, um, and these works reference the changing atmospheric um, character of seasonal cycles. Earth's creation documents the lushness of the green time, and this is in quotes, that um, follows um, periods of heavy rain and makes use of tropical blues, yellows, and greens. This piece has often been likened um, to Claude Monet's studies of seasonal and temper temporal changes, and given its um, formidable um, room-filling scale, a comparison to the artist's um, water lilies um, might be a remarkable um, sort of comparison to make. Let me get that up for you guys. Um, so here's an example of one of um, Monet's water lilies. Um, remember, Claude Monet was um, an expressionist painter, a French expressionist painter. Um, we looked at his um, train station um, series, although he did a lot of different series. Um, 
I think I showed you um, the church cathedral. Um, and again, he really paid attention to the way um, light um, reflected and sort of these atmospheric um, changes um, on, you know, on the environment. And so this is an example of one of his water lilies. And I do think it is, you know, I think this would be a really interesting comparison to make. Um, you know, here you have an artist of, um, you know, beyond the European tradition, and then you're comparing it to one of the probably the most famous, um, you know, European um, Western works of art. Um, so keep that in mind, because sometimes on the AP exam, they do have you um, compare and contrast um, works of art, you know, one from art beyond the European tradition and one like a Western work of art, a traditional sort of European work. So um, this canvas, Earth's Creation, was created as part of a larger um, al Qahir suite, um, which contains 22 panels and is still considered one of the most um, um, virtuosic, virtuosic, or one, one of her masterpieces of Ying Ware's um, immense and prolific artistic output. In the last two weeks of her life, um, Ying Hua Reye completed a suite of 24 small paintings. These were characterized by extremely broad, milky strokes of jewel tone hues of blues and rose, and communicate the artist's long-standing fascination with color and her sophisticated grasp on abstract composition. I think that this might be those here, this example right here. And again, you know, again, you can really see how her style has really changed. You know, here you have these more sort of geometric, amorphic sort of um, designs. And then, you know, it becomes much more abstract, I think. All right, so this is our next artist. We're looking at another female artist. Um, this is um, Sharon Nash Na Nasat um, is called Rebellious Silence, um, Women of Allah series, done in 1994. So she is a photographer. In Rebellious Silence, the central figure's portrait is bisected um, um, along a vertical scene created by a long barrel of a rifle. Presumably, the rifle is clasped in her hands near her lap, but the image is cropped so that the gun rises perpendicular to the lower edge of the photo and grazes her face at the lips, nose, and forehead. The woman's eyes stare intensely towards the viewer from both sides of this divide. So it's a pretty powerful image. Um, Sherwin Nassat's um, photographic series, Women of a Law, examines the complexities of women's identities in the midst of a changing cultural landscape in the Middle East, both through the lens of Western representations of Muslim women and through the more intimate subject of personal and religious conviction. While the composition defined by the hard edge of her black um, shador against the bright, and this is her the, um, the veil um, that she's wearing, against the bright white background um, appears sparse, um, measured and symmetrical. The split created by the weapon implies a more violent rupture of psychic fragmentation. A single subject it suggests um, might be host to um, internal contradictions along binaries such as tradition and modernity. You know, you know, we do hear a lot of stories about how women really do um, in these Middle Eastern countries want, you know, to have more independence or to, you know, to be educated. And, and there's often some complications with that. Um, East and West and other traditions such as East and, and Western ideas of beauty um, um, and violence. In the artist's own words, every image, every woman's submissive gaze suggests a far more complex and paradoxical reality behind the surface. And that's important too. Here you have this woman, you know, confronting us with this intense gaze. Um, it's very powerful. Um, here are some other images from that series. The Woman of Allah series um, confronts the paradoxical reality, though a haunting, um, through a haunting suite of black and white images. Um, each contains a set of four symbols that are associated with Western representations of Muslim world, the veil, the gun, and the text, um, and as well as the gaze. Um, while these symbols have taken on a particular charge since 9-11, um, the series was created earlier and reflects changes that have taken place in the region since 1979 
the year of the Islamic Revolution of Iran. So again, there's an issue here where probably these images seem different um, to probably to someone of your generation um, who's who's grown up under the shadow of 9-11. But it is important for you to remember that these images were created before that event happened. Islamic Revolution. Iran had been ruled by um, the Shah uh, Muhammad Riza um, Pahlavi, who took power in 1941 during the Second World War and reigned as king until 1979, when the Persian monarchy was overthrown by revolutionaries. His dictatorship was known for the violent repression of political and religious freedom, but also for its modernization of the country along Western cultural models. Post-war Iran was an ally of Britain and the United States and was markedly progressive with regards to women's rights. Um, the Shah's regime, however, steadily grew more restrictive and revolutionaries eventually rose to abolish the monarchy in favor of a conservative religious government headed by the Alatola Khomeini. Um, Shroa Nishat was born in 1957 in the town of Kwasvin. In line with um, the Shah's expansion of women's rights, her father prioritized his daughter's access to education, and the young artist attended a Catholic school where she learned about both um, where she learned about both Western and Iranian intellectual and cultural history. She left, however, in the mid 1970s, pursuing her studies in California, as the environment in Iran grew increasingly hostile. It would be 17 years before she returned to her homeland. Um, when she did, she confronted a society that was completely opposed to the one that she had grown up in. So you can imagine, in terms of her identity um, and and her heritage, how how devastating that must have been. Um, or you know, and again, I think you can sort of see the that that sort of duality in her images. So one of the most visible signs of cultural change in Iran has been um, the requirement for all women to wear um, a veil in public. While many Muslim women find this practice empowering and affirmative of their religious identities, the veil has been coded in Western eyes as a sign of Islam's oppression of women. This opposition is made more clear, perhaps, when one considers the um, simul um, of the Islamic Revolution with the women's liberation movement in the U.S. and um, Europe, both developing throughout the 1970s. Um, Nashat, um, decide, Nashat decided to explore this fraught symbol in her art as a way to reconcile her own conflicting feelings. In Woman of Allah series, initiated shortly after her return to Iran in 1991, the veil functions as both a symbol of freedom and of oppression. The veil is intended to protect um, a woman's body from being um, becoming sexualized by the male gaze, but it also protects a woman from being seen at all. The gaze in this context becomes a chagrined, um, a, I'm sorry, a charged signifier of sexuality, sin, shame, and power. Um, Nasat is um, is cognizant of feminist theories that explain how the male gaze is normalized in visual and popular culture. Women's bodies are commonly paraded as objects of desire in advertising and film, available to be looked at without consequence. Um, and uh, many feminist artists have used um, the action of gazing back as a mean to free the female body from this objectification. The gaze here might also reflect exotic fantasies of the East um, in Orientalist paintings of the 18th century. Um, and again, you can think back to um, this period of um, romanticism or neoclassicism, neoclassicism and romanticism, um, Ong and his um, Odalesque. Um, for instance, um, European women were often depicted nude, surrounded by richly colored patterns, textiles, and decorations. Women are um, envisioned amongst other beautiful objects that can be possessed. Um, in Nassat's images, women return the gaze, breaking free from centuries of subversiveness um, to male European desire. Um, so here is um, the, the image I was referring to, Ong's um, Odalesque. Um, that was done. He, you know, remember he was sort of a, he was considered more of a neoclassical painter, but um, also sort of an orientalist um, in this sort of fascination that a lot of French European um, 
men um, had with this idea of the exotic or the other. So you can see here, you know, she is very objectified. Um, you see the patterns, the textiles, you know, these kind of rich, you know, really luxurious objects. Um, she is confronting us though, but I think in a much different way than um, the shots um, figure is. So again, this these two could be an excellent comparison, I think, to make on the AP exam as well. So one of the things you've probably noticed is that most of the subjects in the series are photographed holding a gun, sometimes passively, as in rebellious silence, um, and sometimes threateningly with the muzzle pointed directly towards the camera lens. With the complex idea of the gaze in mind, we might reflect on the double meaning of the word shoot and consider that the camera, especially during the colonial era, was used to violate women's bodies. The gun, aside from its obvious reference to control, also represents religious martyrdom, a subject about which the artist feels um, ambivalently as an outsider to Iranian, ambivalently um, as an outsider to Iranian revolutionary culture. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about um, the text um, as well that we see incorporated into these images. The contradictions between piety and violence, empowerment and suppression are most prevalent in the use of the calligraphic text that is applied to each photograph. Western viewers who do not read Farce um, may understand the calligraphy as an aesthetic signifier, a reference to the importance of text because it's so beautiful and, you know, this, it, it, it's, it's very elegant. And so this might signify that this is, um, you know, this is some sort of important or sacred book. Um, in the long history of Islamic art, yet most of the texts um, are transcriptions of poetry and other writings by women, which express multiple viewpoints and dates both before and after the revolution. Some of the texts that um, Nasat has chosen are feminist in nature. However, in rebellious silence, the script that runs across the artist's face is um, from Talari, um, Safar Sada's poem, Allegiance, and wakefulness, which honors the conviction um, and bravery of martyrdom, reflecting the paradoxical, paradoxical nature of each of these themes, histories, and discourse. The photograph is both melancholic and powerful, invoking the quiet and intense beauty of which Nassat's work has become known. As an outspoken feminist, feminist and progressive artist, Nassat is aware that it would be dangerous to show her work in conservative modern-day Iran, and she has been living in exile in the United States since the 1990s. For audiences in the, in the West, the Woman of Allah series has allowed a more nuanced um, contemplation of common stereotypes and assumptions about Muslim women, and serves to challenge the suppression of female voices in any community. All right, so we're going to be looking at a male artist, and um, and his work um, kind of deals with this idea of what it means to be masculine. Um, this is Pepin Os Osorio, um, in La Barbaras Barbaria No Le um, Laura, which means no crying aloud in the barber shop. Um, it was done in 1994, and it is an installation. Um, so an installation is a medium of work um, that incorporates painting, it might incorporate architecture, sculpture, but it really is, is about the space and creating this sort of environment as well as an experience for um, the audience or viewer. Um, the Puerto Rican-born artist Pepon Osorio trained as a sociologist and became a social worker in South Bronx in New York. His work is inspired by each of these experiences and is rooted in spaces, experience, and people of American Latina culture, particularly um, New Yorkian communities. Um, New Yorkian refers to the Puerto Rican um, dysphoria. Um, this is a sort of um, flood of people, you know, moving to a certain area. Like when we looked at the Harlem Renaissance, there was a dysphoria of African Americans who moved from the South to the North. Um, so there was a dysphoria of um, Puerto Ricans that moved to New York um, City. Um, Oso Rio's large scale installations are meant for a local audience, yet they have been exhibited in mainstream cultural institutions. Um, 
though after the 1993 Whitney Biennial, Orsoria vowed to show his work first within the community and then elsewhere. Um, New Yorkian, that's what it, I'm sorry, New Yorkian. So that's that idea of the Puerto Rican um, moving to New York, New Yorkian. Um, Puerto Rico is a United States territory. Its, re its residents are United States citizens and carry an American passport. Yet they cannot vote in presidential elections or have representatives voting for their interest in Washington. This sense of marginality is further complicated when one considers that New Yorkians often retain a distant sense of cultural pride that is informed by their dual American and Puerto Rican identities. Having lived both experiences, that of a Puerto Rican and New Yorkian, um, Osorio is best known for large-scale installations that address street life, culture clashes, and the rites of passage experienced by Puerto Ricans in the United States. Outside the traditional museum setting and commissioned by Real Art Ways, which um, the acronym is RAW, from Hartford, Connecticut, um, in La Barbaria ne, <laughs> No Se um, Yora, No Crying Aloud in the Barbershop, is a mixed media installation located in the Puerto Rican community of Park Street in Hartford, created in co collaboration collaboration with local residents. Osorio engaged the public through conversation, workshops, and artistic collaboration. The art itself is visually lavish. His installations have been dubbed um, New Yorkian Baroque, a reference to the 17th century um, style characterized by theatrics um, and opulence um, and found in, both Europe, found in both Europe and Latin America. look at some of his other work. Um, so this is um, a detail from another one of his installations, the scene of the crime, or whose crime, and this was done at the New Museum in New York City in 1993. Um, Spanish for trinket, trinkets or knickknacks, um, and um, known to art historians as kitsch. Remember we talked about that when we were looking at um, Kuntz's work mass produce objects characterized by or ironically admired for their bad taste. You know, they're usually kind of cutesy images of gnomes or, um, you know, they're just, they're, they're not, they're sort of considered in the realm of low art. Um, Chicherias, um, I, and I, I guess that's the Spanish or Latin word for kitsch, um, overpopulates Osorio's work. Um, these include Puerto Rican flags, religious ornaments, plastic toys, dolls, ribbons, beads, etc., all of which function to quote art historian Ana um, in, um, in Deitch Lopez, a, a gesture of cultural resistance presented as something universal yet personal. Um, the Chichora, the Chichurias um, included in the installation in La Barbaria, um, a flag, fake foliage, baseballs, framed portraits of famous Latin American and Latino men serve to localize the work, yet these objects also raise issues of social class expressed here through taste um, and the distinction between high and low art, um, effectively straddling a fine line between cultural celebration and social critique. Good vibes. So you can see some other views. Um, so one of the prominent aspects of um, In La Barbaria um, are the video installations featuring Latino men from Park Street in, in stereotypically masculine poses. I know it's kind of hard to see, um, but this is what they're sort of talking about here, this little video screen. The men vary in age. Um, Orsoro included older men from the retirement home, um, Casa del Elderly presenting the issues of machismo as multi generational. And machismo is a sort of masculine, like really, you know, um, just super masculine, super macho sort of male. Um, so, and in that, this idea of machismo as multi generational and deeply ingrained in New Yorkian culture. Um, as a foil to this construction, the artist also includes videos of men crying with the, with the public reacting both sympathy, with sympathy and disgust. 
Um, these same men then participated in workshops in which they discussed how notions of masculinity had shaped their personal relationships as brothers, husbands, and fathers. Despite this participation of men, most of the vid visitors to the barbershop installation were, in fact, women. Um, while in La Barbaria um, challenged definitions of masculinity, it also brings up in a more subtle way the relationships between machismo and homophobia, violence and infidelity, um, and the ways in which popular culture, religion, and politics help craft these identities and issues.